Getting organized here. Okay. Welcome, friends. Good to see you today and have you on this program. We're looking forward to the presentation today about how, how God is in the process of delivering Israel. And it's a type of the last days when uh, God's people will de be delivered again, this time to the, their eternal home. Um, first of all, I'd like to just have my wife give you a little bit of an update on, um, on Last Generation magazine. So I'll turn it over to you, Betsy. Good afternoon. I'm so excited to share with you that we are still having Bible study requests come in from our mailings. And uh, this issue, The Mark of the Beast, we are almost sold out, but we were so close to being sold out, we had to go back to press for some big orders. So we're back at press and we're hoping to get some more magazines mailed out. We would really like to encourage you to take advantage of our zip code mailing projects, or perhaps you would like to find a way to get these magazines out in complimentary magazine stands in your area, contact us. We'll be glad to do that research for you. And if you want to have these Bible study request cards come back to you to develop your own Bible school, we'd be more than glad to do that. Or you can use our uh, Bible study school resource. And as those people begin to study and we put them through several lessons. If they graduate from one, we just put them through another one. And then as they become more aware of making a decision, we can put them in touch with your area. So however you would like to do that, we are a resource to you. That's why we do this work. Without you getting these magazines out and without you finding ways to use this literature, we're kind of just sitting out here in Rapidan waiting to be the other part of the body of Christ. So don't hesitate to let us help you. You can sign people up for subscriptions. You know, you can buy a case or a pack of magazines and share them in your community. Contact us and we'll help you figure out what to do. God bless you. Thank you, Betsy. <clears throat> As we begin today, uh, let us bow our heads and join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we near the end of time, we're, we, we really need to think in practical ways about how you are going to deliver your people. So we need hope and assurance in the struggle ahead too. And we don't want to navigate this time of trouble without it. So we need Jesus to strengthen us for the trial. But we also need to understand the, tr the trials or the deliverance process. So we're not thrown off balance, more off balance than we, than we should be or than necessary. So please be with our, our study today and, and be our teacher too. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the eighth chapter of Exodus. Moses is instructed to go to Pharaoh again and warn him that if he would not obey, all Egypt would be plagued by frogs. Well, scarcely had the bloody water disappeared and Moses was there to give Pharaoh the next lesson about rebellion and obedience. The plague of the frogs. And listen to this, these verses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Notice that in chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, to serve is explicitly defined as corporate worship, sacrificing, worshiping God, and observing the feasts, and and festivals. That was the way God had intended to bless Israel back then. But the broader context of the worship of God also entails serving him as the only God, the exclusive Lord and Master. And so it means worship him, 
worshiping him in all of life, everything, as well as worshiping him in a corporate body. It also means obedience. For worship is empty if we don't obey God. It's, it's useless. So there's a verse of scripture that brings this out. It's found in Isaiah 29, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. In other words, the precepts that are taught of, are of men, not of God. So their worship is in vain. All the aspects of worship are included when God says, that my people may serve me or worship me. Continuing on with verse 2, uh, for his part, Moses bowed before divine majesty. Therefore, he could stand erect before earthly monarchs and potentates and give them God's intentions. And he received fresh instructions daily from heaven, for he worked for a higher potentate than Pharaoh. Um, can, uh, yeah. I'm waiting for the slide. The okay. Slide. No. Okay. I'm sorry. That's just a technical problem. God had said, thus saith the Lord. Now there is a certainty in that statement. There is no suggestion that it is negotiable or pliable. It is an affirmation of divine truth to come next upon Pharaoh and Egypt and the prediction that will come true if Pharaoh doesn't comply. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs, and the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. Imagine that baked frog. <laughs> Ooh. God does not punish for sin, however, unless man persists in it. The word of God says in Psalm 7, 12, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. So God warns men in some way before he sends a judgment. Would somebody let that person in? Um, maybe I can do it. We have somebody waiting to get in and nobody's paying attention to it. So God warns men in some way before he, he sends a judgment and he will favor them and not bring judgment if they turn from their wicked ways. For example, think of how God dealt with Nineveh. You know, if Pharaoh complied with the conditions, God would relent and drop his controversy with him. If thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. You can imagine Pharaoh upon hearing Moses threaten him with frogs. Frogs? You've got to be kidding. Frogs? You can't threaten me with frogs. I am Pharaoh. Do you think that I'm afraid of a little frog? That means nothing. I'll get my magicians to make them too. Your God is not so powerful. Frogs? <laughs> How funny. Imagine... This man, Moses, threatens me with an invasion of frogs. Am I supposed to get my chariots and my horsemen and fight these little frogs? Am I to take my sword out and stop this enemy? <laughs> what does Moses think he is doing? This is ridiculous. We worship the frog because it is a symbol of life and the generation of life. The frogs won't do us any real harm. <laughs> Well, now the Egyptian frogs are much like frogs in the rest of the world. You've all seen them and heard them, at least. <laughs> frogs are small, though these Egyptian ones can grow 
to five inches or so. They are weak. And normally an inconsiderable little animal. And they have no power. But 1 Corinthians 27 gives us God's perspective. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God was going to humble this king, this proud and haughty monarch, with frogs. He was going to turn the tables against Pharaoh and Egypt. The Lord decided to disrupt the rule of Egypt by means of those frogs. In fact, he was going to humble the muddiest and most powerful nation on earth by vast, unrelenting numbers of them. It was not just one or two or a few. Oh, no. There were going to be so many that the Egyptians were going to soon be very tired of them. The Hebrews didn't really know what to call them. They didn't use an exact word for frog. The word is used, the word that is used in verse two is croaker. You know, things that croak. <laughs> Frogs are an Egypt thing. There's naturally a lot of them, but they stay in the river. You know, Moses didn't have another name for them, but he explained that God would confront Egypt with croakers. God would have plagued them. He could have plagued them with lions and bears and wolves or vultures or birds of prey. But he chose to do it by contemptible little instruments, croaking frogs. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Pharaoh is not alarmed or inclined to yield to the divine summons. Aaron is ordered to call up the frogs, the forces with his outstretched arm that, with that remarkable and now fearful rod in his hand. He gives a signal for the battle. Again, his dramatic style. He stretches out um, his frightful rod over the streams and over the Nile and over the farmlands and over the ponds and croaking frogs descend upon the cities and palaces of Pharaoh and, the, and his people. No sooner said than done. The host is mustered and under direction of a commander of invisible power, millions and millions of them invade Egypt with all their might, bringing with them all their weapons that they are known for. Their croaking noise magnified by the sheer numbers, their hopping and crawling, and their penetration into every corner, nook, and cranny, and even into the utensils and ovens for cooking. Ugh. These slimy creatures turned into pests were everywhere. And the Egyptians, with all their might and all their skill, could not stop the progress. They could not corral them. No, not so much as give them a diversion. The frogs came up, literally covered the land. What a nuisance. What a diversion for the Egyptians. What economic and social consequences. God has many ways of creating frustration and exasperation for those that live in ease and sin. Verse 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. The magicians spring into action and pretend to imitate the miracle by their 
occult methods, but they could only fake it. If they really had the power, they could have magically made the frogs go back to where they came from. But the, that was impossible for them. But instead, they only worsened the misery of the people by their own frogs. Doesn't that sound like what modern magicians, scientists and philosophers and politicians and government leaders and even anarchists do today? In the name of improvement of society, they increase the misery rather than help reduce it. Every plan they devise to help the situation only makes it worse, if not immediately, in the long run. And they have no agenda to help the poor. <laughs> that is a, a, that's fake news. If not immediately, I'm sorry, um, they have no agenda to help the poor. In spite of their promises and assurances, the poor are still poor. The sick are still sick. And even the well becomes sick. Every measure devised to improve the economy only makes it worse by intended or unintended consequences. Then the naturalists and scientists try to explain it away. Well, what happened is the water's were fouled, so all the frogs came up on the water, out of the water, out of the waters. There is purely natural explanation for this. It's just merely a natural consequence of cause and effect in flooding in Egypt in the spring. You can hear them, can't you? <laughs> this has never happened before. It's not natural. It's a plague. God overran the muddiest nation on earth with frogs and brought them to the breaking point. Do you think the plagues at the end of time will be explainable by some natural cause? Well, scientists will try. They're already conditioned to this by the disbelief in God. Imagine trying to put up with literally millions of croaking frogs every day and for many days. Pharaoh stepped on them, and sat on them. They hopped in bed with him and croaked in his ear. They got into the closets and furniture and bathtubs and ovens and among the cooking utensils and kneading troughs. They were everywhere. They were croaking in the council chambers, while meetings of state were being collect, co conducted, they hopped into laundry baskets and teacups and water cups and pots. They left their excrement everywhere, which soiled everything and made all Egypt smell bad. They, had, they made a nuisance of themselves and disturbed the Egyptians and rob them of their peace. Imagine sleeping with a frog, a messy frog. Oh, Pharaoh was surprised at how extensively the frogs could invade his kingdom and overrun every home and even his magnificent palace, which the Hebrews no doubt helped build. They were so numerous that they made the Egyptians very uneasy and on the lookout for frogs anywhere. Their whole attention would be given over to the swarming frogs. They couldn't really pay attention to business and trade, commerce and daily life or matters of state. They always had to watch for frogs that they might not step on them or let them get into their food or, or go to bed with them. They couldn't sleep peacefully at night for all the croaking. The pesky little frog would somehow get under the sheets and croak. <laughs> Everywhere the Egyptians looked, there were frogs. Egypt was infested with frogs. They were intolerable. The women would complain to their husbands. 
of the awful creatures that have corrupted the kitchens and would vainly the husbands who would vainly attempt to put them out of the house. But the frogs would just come in some other way more numerous than before. God's curse upon a man will pursue him wherever he goes and will lie heavy upon him in whatever he does. There is no avoiding divine judgments, for they invade upon their lives with a commission and an agenda. And since the frog was considered a god, the frog-faced Hecate, the goddess of fertility, often pictured as a squatting frog. She was supposed to be a good luck charm to increase the fertility of the people. Frogs were regarded as sacred. The Egyptians wouldn't kill them. And they must have apologized to them when they stepped on them or sat on them and squished their plump little bodies. Imagine apologizing to a frog. God was challenging the polytheism of the, and idolatry of the Egyptians. You know, we have frog worshipers today. <laughs> they try to protect the, their environment and prevent marshlands from being drained. I'm not knocking reasonable environmentalism, but it's true. <laughs> there is another reason why God chose to use frogs to punish Egypt. Pharaoh tried unsuccessfully to strike at the fertility of God's people and destroy the Hebrew male children by throwing them into the river, with the frogs nonetheless. So God took out the Egyptian god of fertility, showing that, that he is the only one who gives life. He is the ruler, the sovereign of fertility. But there's more. The infanticide destroyed the basic unit of society, the family. In this case, it was the Hebrew families. The enemy has always been opposed to the concept of family. It was a feature of the creation of man, and today this, uh, is a, this assault is truer than ever. The enemy is seeking to disrupt and destroy the family in many ways, such as divorce, single parent families, and by marriages God has not approved. But he has done it with, <clears throat> in more subtle ways. He has made it more difficult to survive on one income. That's Satan. Sending mothers to work and putting their children in daycare. Families don't eat together. They don't worship together. They don't plan to do good for others together. They spend precious little time together. This plague of the frogs not only looks back at Pharaoh's attempt to kill the children of the Hebrews, but it looks forward to a more severe judgment on Pharaoh, which destroyed the firstborn of Pharaoh down to the lowest cottage in Egypt, to the firstborn of the flocks and the herds. The language used in verse five portrays the idea that frogs were swarming and teeming everywhere. Now listen to the language in chapter 1, verse 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. So this language indicates that the Hebrews were so many swarming and teeming over the land of Egypt that it scared Pharaoh. So he tried to control the population of the Hebrews by killing all the male children, besides causing a variety of social problems, this would have directly affected their ability to procreate. So God directly attacked the goddess of fertility to show the, the Egyptians that he is the one who controls fertility along with everything else. 
and the land and waters swarmed and teemed with frogs. God magnified his own power by using these little creatures to fulfill his purpose. He is Lord of all the hosts of creation and has them all at his beck and call and makes what you see pleases of them. God shows his power as much by making an ant or a frog as by making an elephant. He does his providence in serving his own purpose, purposes by the least of his creatures as effectively as by the strongest. Um, so that proud humanity and the excellency of his power may be seen in justice and as well as in mercy and thereby humble humanity. Why then do we fight God? Who can arm the smallest parts of creation against us when he sees fit to do so? Or in our obstinance and arrogance, how can it be checked but by his awesome power? If God is our enemy, all creatures are at war with us. If God is our friend, then, of course, the creatures are our friends. This lesson has even more significance. For all the hatred against God these days, the fact that nature has destroyed the wicked is a testament to God's abundant mercy. His overwhelming long suffering. What a modification would it have been to haughty Pharaoh, who has reached the zenith of power and majesty, to main, mention, res, not to mention respect, see himself brought to his knees and forced to submit by the humble frog? How despicable! <laughs> Every child is ordinarily able to deal with those invaders and can triumph over them whenever he wants to. Yet now the troops are so numerous and the assaults are so vigorous that the monarch with all his chariots and horsemen and soldiers could not make any headway against them. The truth of the words of Job 12:21 have particular force here. He poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. Pharaoh had contempt for God, so God had contempt for the monarch. Pharaoh was no more a sovereign than God permitted him to be. And if Pharaoh would not acknowledge the sovereignty of, of God above him, God would use one of his humblest creatures to insult him and trample upon him from the humblest cottage to the sumptuous resorts and lordly palaces. The frogs were a direct assault on Pharaoh's rule. Pharaoh and all his people were so annoyed with the frogs that finally Pharaoh called for Moses. He had not done that before. Moses had come to him with the demand to let the people go to worship God in the wilderness. Verse then, eight. then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. Pharaoh is somewhat humbled and acknowledge the God of heaven. This is also something that he had not done before, but he is impatient to have the frogs removed. And he begs Moses to intercede for him with the Lord to remove the frogs. He who had a little while before denied the existence of God and has spoken with the utmost disdain 
of both God and Moses is now willing to acknowledge him and plead with him for mercy. He places himself <clears throat> in the position of an underling to God and Moses and asked Moses to remove the nuisance, the plague of the frogs. Pharaoh realizes that the magicians cannot remove the frogs. Pharaoh's gods have failed him again, and he has no choice but to yield the battlefield to the power and sovereignty of God through the, the muddy little frogs. Those that defy God and live in wickedness with abandon in his sight will one day, in a day of extremity, be made to see that they need him and will cry for mercy. How ironic. Intercede for me, he says. He asked Moses to pray, and he even promises to let the people go and worship, however insincere it might be. This is not a willing action of Pharaoh. Pharaoh in a, is in a tight spot now and turns to Moses and Aaron and asks them to pray for him. Isn't that how it, it is today, even with those who don't believe in God? <laughs> when they get in a, tight, in a tight spot, they suddenly pray. Won't that be the way the wicked will acknowledge God's power and goodness at the end of the millennium? Listen to it from Great Controversy, page 662. Every eye in that vast multitude is turned to behold the glory of the Son of God. With one voice the wicked hosts exclaim, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It is not love to Jesus that inspires this utterance. The force of truth urges the words from unwilling lips. As the wicked went into their graves, so they come forth with the same enmity to Christ and the same spirit of rebellion. They are to have no new pr probation in which to remedy the defects of their past lives. Nothing would be gained by this. A lifetime of transgression has not softened their hearts. A second probation were it given them would be occupied as was the first in evading the requirements of God and exciting rebellion against him. Exodus 8, verse 9. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? The phrase glory over me simply means it is your honor to choose a time for the plague to cease. Moses did, did this to show Pharaoh that his performance of the request is not dependent on the conjunctions or operations of the planets or the luckiness of one hour of the day over another. There is no magic involved here, simply the power of God over nature. Moses intended to convict Pharaoh. If his eyes were not opened by the plague, they might be opened by its removal. Verses 10 and 11. And he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people they shall remain in the river only. Moses essentially says that the Lord alone has the power to send and to relieve the plague. Why did he not set the time to retire the plague immediately? Was he so fond of his guests that he would have them stay another night? Was he not tired enough of them? From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 256 and 266, uh, 265 and 266, we read the following. He set the next day, secretly hoping that in the interval the frogs might disappear themselves, and thus save him from the bitter humiliation of submitting to the God of Israel. 
The plague, however, continued till the time specified. Pharaoh's secret wish didn't pan out. The plague stayed with Egypt until the specified time. He was forced to reckon with the very things he wanted to avoid. And that's the way God deals with all sinners. They are forced in some way to come face to face with their sin and repent and receive mercy or reject God's offer of forgiveness and suffer deeper consequences. Moses said, Be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our It shall be done exactly when you say, because by this you will know that whatever the magicians pretend to do, that there is none like unto the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. This is not magic. <coughs> this is God. There is none that has such a command of nature and over the creatures that can do this plague and make a remedy for it. Nor is there one like the Lord God who is so ready to forgive those that humble themselves before him. The great design, both of judgment and mercy, is to convince us that there is none like the Lord our God, none so wise, None so mighty, none so good, none so helpful. No enemy is so formidable, no friend so desirable, no one so valuable as God. Verse 12. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs, which he had brought against Pharaoh. And Moses prevailed with God in earnest prayer for the removal of the frogs. Verses 13 and 14. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields, and they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. Oh boy. Moses tells Pharaoh that the frogs will depart. But interestingly, he does not tell Pharaoh how. He simply tells Pharaoh that the only living frogs left will be the ones in the Nile. Boy, that should Pharaoh have attached a caveat to that request. Moses leaves the palace, and we're told that he cries out to the Lord in prayer. Can you imagine this story being told by the former slaves around the fires in the wilderness? They knew that they were a people who had been utterly powerless. They've had no say about their work. They've had no say about their wages. They have had no say about their family life, about their ability to move from place to place about their ability to improve their own situation. And suddenly they are being told that the most powerful man that they have ever known is reduced to the point that he has to go to the religious leader and ask him to pray to God to remove the frogs. <coughs> this was a great acknowledgement that the future of the nation of Egypt was not in the hands of Pharaoh but in the hands of God. Can you imagine the humiliating position that Pharaoh is in? Friends, it's the same way today. Nations are in the hands of God, not in their rulers. And the rulers may be oppressive, but they are only there ruling by God's providence. He gives them time to show their true colors. Anyway, Pharaoh's in a humili humiliating position. You mean to tell us, God, that your prayers are more significant in the course of your designs in history of nations than the rulers of the nations? 
And God says, you better believe it. You are my people, and I rule the world by my word and my spirit. And I choose your prayers as one of the instruments of my decree to move the course of nations forward and reveal my divine plan. Perhaps you are in a situation that makes you feel utterly powerless. Consider this scene. Whatever is powerful at a human level in our experience, it cannot match the power according to God's sovereign mercy. If your prayer of intercession is in accordance with his sovereign will, God will answer it. God's people may look powerless to this world, but by prayer, they are the chosen instruments of the future of time and history. You are never completely powerless in this world when you serve a sovereign God and you pray earnestly and humbly before him. You can move many powerful earthly um, rulers. Maybe your health is going on you. You feel so out of control. This is your body. You've always been in control of your body, and suddenly your body is not serving you like it used to. Maybe it's a family situation. Everything you try doesn't work, and you feel utterly powerless, As and God is saying to you, you're never powerless. I use the instrument of prayer. I hear my people. And Pharaoh can't measure up to the influence that you have over me. No Pharaoh in your life can outsmart or out, um, outpower God. The frogs came up out of the water in one day and perished when the Egyptians had had enough. Probably the next day, plus one. <laughs> I don't know how long it was, really. And they all died when it, wherever they were, so that the Egyptians would have to gather them and their dead bodies and take them out of their houses and pile them up in the streets. They raked up the bodies into heaps. Keep in mind that they were everywhere, including in the fields, in the forests, in the roads, and in the byways as well. They couldn't collect them all. They did their best to collect them out of their homes and barns, but there were still plenty that they didn't get in the fields and in the ditches. These heaps and remaining bodies stank with a putrid smell as they decayed. The great sovereign of the universe makes what use he pleases of the lives and deaths of his creatures. And he that gives them being to serve one purpose may, without committing injustice, use them another way to serve another purpose. In other words, God sends frogs to overrun Egypt. Then he uses their dead bodies to overwhelm Egypt with smell to show that it is not magic that has done this. Listen to it from Patriarchs and Prophets, six, uh, two, 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 it's 266, I think. Yes, the Lord page, could have... I'm sorry, it's page 266, not 226. The Lord could have caused them to return to dust in a moment. But he did not do this, lest after their removal, the king and his people should pronounce it the result of sorcery or enchantment, like the work of the magicians. The frogs died and were then gathered together in heaps. Here the king and all Egypt had evidence which their vain philosophy could not gainsay, that this work was not accomplished by magic, but was a judgment from the God of heaven. I don't know if you can imagine the scene. There's Pharaoh. 
the great monarch of the greatest nation on earth at the time, holding a damp cloth to his mouth and nose, trying to reduce the stench in his nostrils. He can hardly contain himself and his composure because of the smell. Will somebody get rid of the rotting dead frogs? He commands. The smell is driving me mad. But your eminence, says one of his aides, they are too numerous to do it quickly. The housekeeping department is working as fast as they can. Besides, the frogs have died in places around the palace that are nearly impossible to get into. The stench also gave the Egyptians something to distract them from their projects and from the Hebrew slaves. Again, business, trade, commerce, weddings, funerals, social gatherings, feasts, essentially all the cultural events, all of society came to a halt in order to deal with the dead frogs. The death and stench of the frogs foreshadowed the the death of the firstborn, the object which the Egyptians revered as a symbol of life and fertility became a symbol of decay and death. This plague, like the, all the others, was against the government of Egypt because the rulers persecuted God's people and stubbornly refused to yield to God's will. Do you think that's how it's going to be at the end of time? Will it be against the rulership of the nations? The plagues, the 10 last plagues? It certainly will. God always works with our hearts. And this is no different with Egypt. If Pharaoh would have softened his heart and was willing to yield his pride, he would have preserved his power and would have not been not devastated his kingdom. God could have blessed Egypt abundantly, so abundantly that they would have been a great superpower. But things didn't go that way. And eventually Egypt was devastated because of one man's rebellion. Pharaoh lost not only his crown, but his life all because of his stubbornness and rebellion. The lesson is clear. We cannot think that we know better than God. God is all-knowing, and we may not be given understanding of why God allows certain things, but we can rest assured that God's purpose, even under pain, are benevolent and designed to lead us to salvation. God is good all the time. Even his plagues are merciful toward the rebellious sinner. But when man continues in rebellion, in spite of the evidence, when we continue in violation of God's laws, eventually the rebellion will destroy us. That's one of the reasons why God did not remove the frogs' dead bodies that polluted the atmosphere and fouled the air so the Egyptians could not breathe without smelling the offensive stench. It was to remind Pharaoh and the Egyptians of the late plague and that he should not harden his heart, lest a worse plague come upon him and the nation. Verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. When Pharaoh saw that there was respite without considering the massive disruption and distraction of the frogs that were, that it was to, that the frogs were to his kingdom and his people, and without considering what, that a worse course, a worse thing, could be coming if he didn't relent, he defiantly and stubbornly hardened his heart and refused to let Israel go. Friends, have you ever seen someone so stubborn that no matter the consequences, they will double down in their position, even if they know that doing so will hurt them? 
if not immediately, in the long run. I have, and I can only pity them. Now let me ask you, have you ever done this yourself? You sin and God rebukes you. You keep on sinning and God punishes you and you still keep on doing that same thing. Well, well, you're just like Pharaoh, blindly doubling down and I can only pity you. But I have done the same thing. I have doubled down in my rebellion and had much trouble for it in my life. All my troubles come upon me because I stupidly cling to my sins. So I guess I can pity myself too. <laughs> I hope on God's mercy and his pity. God pities us, every one of us. And God pitied Pharaoh too, as he has he was long-suffering with Pharaoh and gave him many opportunities to do what is right. And he does the same with us till we are brought to surrender to him or our hearts are so hardened in sin that he must leave us to ourselves. God is good to those who love him. God is good to those who hate him. God is good to those who pretend to be his people. God is good. His responses and interactions may be different for each one of those types of people, but he is always good. We could say the same for mercy. God is always merciful. We could say the same for long suffering for God is long-suffering. Whatever attribute we describe to God, uh, ascribe to God, we can apply this principle. God responds differently to each one of us because we have different needs and different personalities. We need different ways of dealing to bring us to repentance. But all of it is because God is good. Here is something to think about. It's from Fundamentals of Education, page 409. There are laws of nature, but they are harmonious and conform with all God's working. When the Lord's many and the God's many set themselves to explain God's own principles and providences, presenting to the world strange fire in the place of divine, there is confusion. The machinery of earth and heaven needs many faces to every wheel in order to see the hand beneath the wheels, bringing perfect order from confusion. The living and true God is a necessity everywhere. So God works to bring about his will amid the human things going on. If we don't bring trouble upon ourselves by our rebellion to his will, the more aligned with his will we are and think his thoughts, the less trouble we will have. When Pharaoh hardened his heart, he signaled to his people that they could keep on with their oppression and rebellion and harden their hearts too. He had a lot of influence over others. Therefore, he had more responsibility to do what was right and lead by example. Israel had multiplied themselves abundantly. They were very fertile. And that caused Pharaoh to become jealous of them. So he conjured up an excuse to enslave them. He feared them. When God blesses man, others become jealous and wish to put them down. This is the never-ending controversy between Christ and Satan on this earth and uh, until the end of time, for that matter. When God blesses his people, the enemy of God and man tries to limit the, re the effect. In fact, he tries to make slaves of us in so many ways. 
But God can and will deliver us when it is for our best good. Until the heart is renewed by divine grace, we are impervious to the impressions that would otherwise have been made under affliction. Pharaoh's conviction that he must relent wore off. The promises made by him that he was, while he was under pressure to make them, were quickly forgotten. What thaws in the sun will freeze again in the shade until the air is changed and even the shade temperature is above freezing. If we rebel and push at God, he turns up the heat. God's patience is shamefully abused by unrepentant sinners. And Pharaoh was certainly unrepentant. God gave him a respite to lead him to repentance, which was meant to soften his heart. But instead it hardened him by his own choices. The voice of the Holy Spirit was a little softer after the rejection. God graciously allowed Pharaoh a truce in order to make peace, but he took the opportunity to rally the baffled forces of an obstinate infidelity. Let us read Ecclesiastes 8, uh, 11. Ecclesiastes 8, 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. If God was hard, he could have punished Pharaoh with a full penalty for his sin of obstinance. But God would have seen, God, but would, let's start over, and God would have been right to do that. If he had done all, done that all along, that might have gotten only an early compliance with his will. But God would be, would then be accused of being a tyrant and would have caused men to serve him out of fear instead of love. God is not like that. Psalm 78, 34 puts it succinctly. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. But God didn't do that. He doesn't mete out punishment we deserve. He gave Pharaoh an opportunity, many opportunities, to see the light and check the evil that he was doing to God's people and repent and cooperate with God. The respite granted to him would have been sufficient warning to him and that in order to expect another plague. For if, if it go away for a time and it hardens him and he lost the benefit of it, we may conclude it goes away with a purpose to return and it only make room for a worse plague to come. It isn't wise to play with God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so impressed with how you dealt with Pharaoh and the Egyptians and we don't want to be stubborn and rebellious like Pharaoh. So please, soften our hearts. Please, have mercy on us, I pray. And may we learn the lessons of the plague of the frogs. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. And I hope that you will come on over. If you're on YouTube, you'll come on over to Zoom and uh, join in the after discussion for a little while. And uh, we will begin that very shortly, in a minute or so or less. God bless you. And until next month, keep the faith.